Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Jen Schleter, and I'm Dean of Graduate Studies at Columbus College of Art and Design, a nonprofit art and design college that has been a creative force within Central Ohio for more than 140 years. I want to welcome you to tonight's event, which is part of CCAD's Visiting Artists and Scholars series. We are thrilled to host Ruki Newhold Ravi Kumar tonight. Each semester, CCAD welcomes guest artists and scholars to teach workshops and seminars, engage in one-on-one -on -one mentoring and studio visits with graduate and undergraduate students, and to offer a lecture as part of this series. And while we wish we could gather together here on campus in downtown Columbus as we typically would, we are really happy to be able to take this time to be together online. And so before we jump into Ruki's talk, um, I want to just share a few housekeeping notes. First, we're recording today's talk so that we can share it on our website for those who aren't able to join us. Um, today's event is in a webinar format. All lines are muted and videos are off other than for the speakers. Um, and we will be able to um, answer your questions. So please feel free to use the Q&A function throughout the discussion to submit them. Um, and you're also welcome to use the chat function to do the same. We wanna make sure we recognize some very special organizations. Our Visiting Artists and Scholars series is made possible thanks to the support from the Greater Columbus Arts Council, the Ohio Arts Council, and the Skestos Endowment Fund for Visiting Artists and Lecturers. And now I'm gonna to introduce tonight's speaker. Ruki Newhold Ravi Kumar is acting director of the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, where she oversees 100 full-time employees and a collection of more than 215,000 design objects spanning 30 centuries. She was also recently named the Nerman Family President Select of the Kansas City Art Institute, and she will assume that new role on July the 1st. Originally from Chennai, India, Ruki draws from her international experiences as a designer to tackle every role she has had. At the height of the pandemic, she was the Smithsonian's acting undersecretary for education, responsible for defining the institution's educational priorities as it prepared to mark its 175th anniversary. She focused on sharing the vast resources of the Smithsonian to support the needs of K through 12 educators and students at the local and national levels and led a Smithsonian-wide team that specifically responded to the distance learning needs of teachers, students, and families that were caught in the digital divide. She previously served as the Smithsonian's Interim Associate Provost for Education and was Director of Education at the Cooper Hewitt. Before joining the Smithsonian in 2017, she was the Associate Dean of the College of Fine Arts and Design at the University of Central Oklahoma, where she had advanced from undergraduate professor to director of graduate programs and to chair of the Department of Design. She's also an award-winning designer and has served in leadership roles at all levels of the American Institute of Graphic Arts, including the AIGA Design Educators Community and local and national boards. In 2015, she was named an AIGA Fellow by the Oklahoma Chapter for her advocacy and her leadership as a design educator. Please join me in welcoming Ruki Newhold Ravi Kumar for her lecture entitled Human Capacity for Change. Hello and good evening, everyone. I wish I could have done this talk in person but I'm still so thankful to have this opportunity. Jen, thank you so much for this invitation and very warm welcome. It was such a joy to be in so many classrooms virtually and I thank you all for the great conversations. The reason we're doing this virtually today is because of the pandemic. At the start of the pandemic, many of us took to new hobbies. Some worked out, some did baked a lot of sourdough, and many took to admiring nature in their own backyards and communities. I'm one of those people. So it might be supper time for you, or just the end of a really long work day. So as you settle in to watch this lecture, I'd just like you to take a breath and watch this very short video that I took in early 2020. Don't worry, there's no audio. And I'm sorry, it's coming in a little choppy.
But I hope you've noticed and figured out that you have, that I spotted a hummingbird. Well, for several days, I watched this little bird return to the same branch and do this intricate little dance with tiny pieces of leaves in her beak. It eventually turned into this. It's beautiful, isn't it? It turned into this beautiful little cup. Apologies for the shaky video. I was still trying to figure out how to do it all. Her beautifully constructed nest is made with leaves and plant material and is all held together with spider silk. The beauty of this nest is that um, its design is that it is really in its design and it's built for change. The materials that she has used will allow the nest to expand. As she lays her eggs and cares for her young, um, all of the materials will grow and expand. As humans, we have so much to learn from nature. To design with change in mind, to write so ideas can be re rewritten. These ideas are only reinforced in the vast collections of the Smithsonian's 19 museums. And I have a few stories that I'd like to share with you today under the title of Human Capacity for Change. I'd like to start from a personal place. Yesterday, I got to vote for the first time. The key word is not vote. The key word is got to vote. It was my first time ever. I was too young to vote when I first left India and I became a citizen last year. As an immigrant, I'm becoming less and less fearful of change. From personal experiences, I can attest that mostly good has come of change. But as Jen said, I'm originally from India. My undergraduate studies were in history of fine art and drawing and painting. During my final year of study, I chose to study the evolution of the onion dome on Islamic monuments. My research led me to the Taj Mahal, which is a prime example and really the pinnacle in the evolution of the dome. But what also fascinated me about this monument is that it's what the world thinks of when they think of India. Early history books written by the British who occupied and colonized India after the Muslim rule romanticized this white opulent marble structure in otherwise filthy India. Documented history states that Empire Shah Jahan, Emperor Shah Jahan built this palace in honor of his beloved wife, Mumtaz Mahal. Design stories of this monument are rarely told. It's an amazing example of symmetry. The minars or the four pillars that flank the monument are built at an angle tilting outward. So they give off the optical illusion of being perfectly straight. In my lifetime, I've never seen at least one of the minars without scaffolding around them because the angle challenges the stability. The typography that adorns the entrance is gradually enlarged. The visitor can read all the way to the top. That level of integration of math and typography is something I'm completely in awe of and is something I've never learned in a typography class. I'm also intrigued that this building that is globally seen as a symbol of love, an emotion that is so socially taboo in most of India. What no one tells us in history books are the gruesome stories. The gruesome stories that 
often get discounted as tacit knowledge, passed down knowledge. Stories that thousands of craftsmen, designers, craftsmen who inlaid all of these the stones, um, the typography, who figured out all of this typography were maimed after this monument was built. So they could never build a replica of the Taj Mahal again. Now take a moment. If you're near your computer and you're listening to this lecture, if you learned that today, would this monument still symbolize love for you? If you could rewrite the history of the Taj Mahal, what would it stand for? And how would you rewrite the story? If you could put a few words in the chat for me, that would be helpful. And I'd love to look at them when we uh, address the chat. So just take a few moments and add to the chat right now. What I've enjoyed most about my various roles at the Smithsonian is finding that design is a layer, is a story layer in almost every object. One of the stories that I've now enjoyed learning most is about Victor Green's Negro Motor Screen Book. And it's really made me ask this very important question. How permeable is history, is the history we know to new influences? It was a book that was developed for the safe passage of black people at a time when ironically black Americans were more mobile because of the coming of age of the automobile. The book tells so many stories, but as a designer, I was struck by really all of the advertising. It seemed to be missing, there it is. The book was developed for the safe passage of black people at the time when ironically Americans were more mobile because of the coming of age of the automobile. The book tells so many stories. As a designer, I was really struck by all of the advertising and evidence of businesses run by black women at a time when women entrepreneurs were unheard of. The story of the automobile in America is porous, wrinkled, scarred, and will look different to each person who lived that experience. For some, it was a period of constantly negotiating life and death. And for some, it was about an expanded radius of opportunity. For me, after looking at all of these stories throughout the Smithsonian, I think about that history, after all, is the grandest story about patterns, the ones that existed, and then the stories of the people who break them. Isn't that what history books are all about? I've called Oklahoma home since 2004. Uh, I started hearing about Black Wall Street uh, in the Greenwood neighborhood of Tulsa only a few years ago. Many are working to bring the story of the nation's largest racially motivated massacre out of the shadows and into the light. It's taken nearly a hundred years of the conspiracy of silence to be broken. For the events to be acknowledged for what it is, a massacre and not a riot. I do not believe that the history and the canon are so rigid that if new layers of narrative were introduced or if gaps in stories were found, that existing stories would vaporize. Like the hummingbird's nest, history has space to expand, to stretch to accept new voices, to add the stories that got left out and to correct the errors that were made in interpretation. Here's another wonderful resource that I hope you will peruse a little later. It's a physical and online exhibition that was developed by the National Museum of the American Indian. It makes you realize that there are three parts to every equation, or at least every story. The increase of knowledge, the diffusion of it, and finally, the interpretation of it. If you've only ever been offered one interpretation of history, then you're missing the full picture, because at the very least, 
there are three versions of every story, your version, my version, and the truth. In 2018 at the Cooper Hewitt, there was an exhibition called Bob Greenberg Selects. Bob Greenberg is an award-winning communication designer and founder of the international design innovation company called RGA. Greenberg has been a pioneer of the advertising communication industry for four decades. To emphasize design's key role in our increasingly connected world, Greenberg as a guest curator chose 42 significant objects to illustrate how technology has propelled design, propelled design innovation in form, style, and function over the past 65 years. The installation underscored how historical objects point to future innovation. In one section, his arrangement of objects that you're seeing on the screen right now showed how the evolutionary pathways of multiple objects, the calculator, the calendar, the camera, had all merged into one object, the smartphone. Now you can imagine that today's digital native generation is very familiar with the smartphone, but not so familiar with its earlier iteration, the corded rotary phone. We have various iterations of this in our collection. And I remember looking at this and smiling because I grew up with one. And I remember innovation at one time was when the cord got longer because that means you could take it into the closet or your bedroom and that meant more privacy. It meant you didn't have to talk to your friends in the middle of your family room. That was innovation at a certain point. Suddenly, innovation meant when you could take it in your pocket. Cell phones were once so large that a brick was lighter than the cell phone itself, but it was portable and somehow that was innovative. On a tour of this exhibit with a group of 10 year olds, um, which I had the pleasure of leading. This is my sort of favorite age group to walk around the museum because they, they test my ability every time. When I led them through thinking routines to make them make their thinking visible, and I asked them to, to you know, those questions of, um, you know, what do you see and what do you think and what are you wondering? Um, the first questions that I got was, how do you text with this phone? And when I said, you didn't text back then, they all looked at me and just together started laughing because the idea of not being able to text just seemed ridiculous. And why would you need a phone if you didn't text? The entire group burst out laughing and could not imagine a world where a phone was simply used to talk to people. In 1876, Alexander Graham Bell successfully transmitted his first message over the telephone. Over 140 something years later, the design and use of a phone has changed from a communication device to a mirror that reflects the state of our humanity. With a phone in our hands, we feel empowered to be historians, to be journalists, and more importantly, to be storytellers. We share an edited truth of ourselves and demand an unabridged truth of our society. We document the extremes of beauty and horror. We play with the tensions between anonymity and exposure. We represent what we stand for with a hashtag. Tools and technology have leveled the playing field, creating equal access to opportunity, or have they? And equal access to storytelling. The world now has more voices, telling and authoring stories, asking questions, 
about missing stories at museums and cultural organizations. The museums of the past used to be cabinets of curiosities. The museums of the future are social communal spaces. They're places where we have important dialogues about how our communities and humans change. People now ask questions about access to collections, collections that used to be behind walls that were only accessed by specialists. This is now a new predicament because collections used to be coded to be only accessed by specialists and now the general public would like to access them. So museums now face a unique challenge. But you see advancements. Museums like the Portrait Gallery, for instance, have already created unique and innovative ideas where their metadata is bilingual. So from the get-go, they can produce bilingual content. But we still have challenges. Like during the pandemic, we found that a lot's parents were not able to find content that they were absolutely sure that the Smithsonian had. They were looking for content on spiders, but at the Smithsonian, we had it coded as arachnids. So there's clearly a disconnect. We have students ask us every day, how many designers of color do you have in your collection? And I cannot answer that question because we've never ever documented the racial identity or even gender of a designer when we've collected an object. Are these things new conversations in the museum? Of course they are. With something as simple as a telephone, we see how much behave, human behavior has changed from holding a phone close to our ear to holding one away from our bodies. At restaurants, we see families sitting together and yet distance because they're separated by their phones. We see friends taking selfies and posting moments of togetherness, but disconnected in the present. There's already a crack in that narrative. What we, what they are representing, presenting and telling as stories is not true. So if that's the case, what has us so convinced that the history we read today doesn't have gaps, was not also embellished as well? The past two years has changed us all in big ways and in small. The next time you play Pictionary, when you get the word mask, you're less likely to draw this and more likely to draw this. Sorry, my slides are stuck. More likely to draw this. Between 2020 and 2022, uh, we realized that there were two pandemics, COVID-19 and systemic racism. And unfortunately, the more conversations I'm in, I hear that we are beyond grappling with the pandemic because they are more endemic. Because people are fearful, people feel paralyzed by the sheer colossal nature of change, that it's too inconvenient to make behavior shifts, that there isn't enough information or there's too much information, or there's simply difficulty in making that kind of seismic shift. What I truly believe after five years at the Smithsonian and listening to all of these stories, reading all these case studies is that after looking at the dual pandemics and how much it's affected all of us, that the hum under the human capacity for change, what really fuels it is the human capacity to learn. So thank you very much. And I hope to take some questions and open this up to more of a conversation. Great. Oh, thank you very much, Ruki, for getting us started with that. It was a really um, inspiring look at what an archive and what a museum can do. Um, 
please go ahead, folks, and drop um, questions into the Q and A if you want um, to sort of pick Ruki's brain. Um, I would love to start us off um, thinking about what you said about the tension between the cabinet of curiosities model that museums used to live in and the movement to the social communal space. And I'm wondering, as somebody who has lived both in that world and in the world of higher education, if you could talk a little bit about the ways that you might see that tension uh, playing out in higher ed as well. Sure, I think we're looking at all of our spaces, you know, uh, changing and the definitions of, of spaces changing as well. Um, I, I think in the last year, everything was challenged. The COVID-19 um, exposed the vulnerabilities of every system and uh, wherever people were and people couldn't be anymore, it made us think about spaces, culture, human behavior quite differently. And so in museums where the premise was that you would walk in in order to engage and that was no longer possible, it made us think about how do you now have audiences interact and are museum spaces still important spaces if audiences can interact with you virtually? And I think universities started to ask the same questions as well, right? If you can, um, everyone can access education online, then is that more equitable or is that less equitable? And what is the difference between in-person instruction versus online instruction? And, um, and ultimately, I, I think it comes down to the fact that there's no one size fits all, but the fact that over time things will change. And if you look at the very beginning from the Socratic model of people learning from under a tree and what they wanted from a teacher to what it is that education means for people today and how people learn today. And um, there have been seismic shifts in the understanding of education, the value of education, um, how people differentiate between information, knowledge, transference, um, and all of those things. And I think when you put all of those together, therein lies, I think, both tension, but also opportunity. Yeah, how, how might you think about that opportunity as you move to the Kansas City Art Institute, one of our fellow um, ACAD institutions? Well, I'm very excited by it. You know, the uh, I was very, I think, empowered by listening to students because today's students, especially during the time when um, the museums were closed and I got to talk to communities who were struggling to connect to resources. Uh, and a lot of them were from underserved communities you know, one of the most emotional calls that we probably had was from Puerto Rico, where they were struggling well before the pandemic. Um, they had already been hit by several hurricanes and their educational systems were down and had not fully recovered and then COVID happened. And so when they received resources in printed format, they were overjoyed because they finally had seen, gotten some relief when they were trying to solve this technology problem. No one had ever thought about trying to solve it without technology. And so to get something in hand that they could do immediately, it was, it was just sort of a light at the end of the tunnel, you know, for them. And so I think I've learned a lot about people and opportunities and um, looking at the past to move forward into the future. And I just am so excited to take a lot of that learning back into higher education. And uh, the possibilities are endless. And I know that the Kansas City Art Institute also believes in really looking at, uh, you know, looking at the future where the possibilities are truly endless. It's really exciting. All right, let me ask you this. I'm thinking about what you said about um, how the 
you can't answer the question how many designers of color are held in the Cooper Hewitt's collection because that information wasn't collected um, or how uh, the metadata at I think it was the National Portrait Gallery is both in English and in Spanish so that we can we can um, move quickly between those two. So yeah. there's lots of ways in which um, collection is certainly not neutral. And you were suggesting that about history itself, but there's yours and there's mine, there's the, tr the truth, right? Um, so I'm wondering, what can a place like Cooper Hewitt do when they discover a kind of blind spot in their collecting habits like that? What happens next? You know, I think it's, uh, we've been having these conversations in the museum sector about how the history of collecting was something that people with means and opportunity did, right? If you look at even our founding collectors, which were, to um, two women with great intentions, the Hewitt sisters, Sarah and Eleanor Hewitt. And I'm grateful to them because they actually created a collection with the intention of it serving as a teaching collection. So they, during their travels, brought back objects that they intended for it to serve as teaching tools so people could learn from them. So almost building a three-dimensional library of sorts. So not something that would sit behind glass necessarily. So I love that our collection is built on that. And there is an exhibition that is now open around their collecting efforts, but collecting at its basis was something that people with means and opportunity typically did. And that's, that's what made it into museums. But collecting, if you really think about it, is actually something everybody does. Uh, if you even look around your office or my, or my home, all of us have a tendency to hold on to something because it's memory. It's, and that's why I always think of the Smithsonian uh, or any museum as less of an attic and more as our memory. It's, we hold on to these things to help because memory is individual, but it's also collective, it's also cultural. And it's these objects that help us remember. And, and that's why I have mixed feelings about removing things because there are good lessons to be learned and bad lessons to be learned. We also need to learn about what bad things happen to never do them again. Uh, and, and so, you know, I think about all of well, those types of things as I think about the, the collection and, and what opportunities there are, but they inform, every museum has a collection plan that's very closely tied to its mission. Not all museums are collecting museums, but ours is. And, and that's where we're thinking about, as we tell the story of design moving forward, how can we tell a more thorough, more robust story where voices don't continuously get excluded. And I feel very proud that in the exhibitions that we've done in the recent past, that that has been an effort. So in the E. McKnight Kaufer exhibition that opened recently, we, you know, the, the two curators who worked on it, Caitlin Condell and Emily Orr, did many, many years of research and learned that his partner, uh, her work is left out of a lot of the work that is published about him and made a very special effort to include her in the exhibition because there's a very clear influence of her uh, in his work. And people forget that, that people didn't just work in a vacuum, that you know, our, our lives, our partners, our family members, our kids, our, they all in, you know, affect us in some ways. It's our complete environment. And that is our full story. Uh, and that somehow gets left out. So when we read about people in history books, they're represented as an individual who did this one poster at this one time or did this one object at this one time sitting in their studio, but it's, it's not the entire picture, if we knew them more as people who were influenced and in living life in a certain way, I think that interpretation, and that's what I love about what we do in the museum world, is that we think about interpretation on such a conscious level um, that 
that conscious collecting, responsive collecting, and thoughtful collecting along with thoughtful conscious interpretation, I think is the future. Mm, that's really beautiful. Um, somebody's asking a question that sort of builds on some of this. So uh, they're noting that first that they love your perspective on collecting, me too. Um, but they're wondering, could that also be applied to education and what ways we can see blind spots in our pedagogy, especially I think our art and design pedagogy? Yeah, I, I think, you know, after going to the museum, I felt like I will teach very differently because um, as a student I, of design, I don't feel like I asked the same questions that I do right now about the voice of the person writing the book and what was the, it was their interpretation of history. And I don't know anything about them or their circumstances or what influenced them to write in that way. You know, they could be a feminist they could be a socialist, they could be a capitalist. And that view impacts how they see the world. And that's how they interpreted the information that they collected as part of their research. And they presented it in the book as history. And I read it and consumed it. And I consumed it as fact. And as a student, I should have done a better job of asking why. And I should have done a better job of asking who else wrote about it and what else was going on and tried to join more dots. And that's what I would encourage, I think is more discourse in classes to, to create those webs of information, um, to really try to map out, you know, if a McKnight Cowfer was designing a poster who else was doing work at the same time? Who were the contemporaries? Who were the competition? If he won a, if he won um, a proposal, who lost that proposal? And uh, who were the women in his life? <laughs> you know. Uh, so those were the kinds of things that that I, I think that. And what was his family life like? And how much did it cost to design a poster at that time? And how much work did he do because he simply had to pay the bills? Those are things that I think we need to ask. What was cause and effect? Uh, what was he responding to? Like, I remember being really uh, influenced by McKnight Cowfer early in my career because growing up in India as a graphic designer, I was very Indian aesthetic when you look around uh, is very ornamental, uh, very rich color palette, and it's beautiful, but it's also an aesthetic where, where more is more, and more is, is good, you know, and it's something that when you come here and people tell you less is more, it's a, it's a shift, it's a huge mental shift, that when I looked at his Invisible Man cover, um, it was, it was powerful for me because it was the opposite of everything I had ever learned. So that was my first exposure to McKnight Kaffer. And then full circle years later, we have an exhibition at the Cooper Hewitt and I had goosebumps because here's a designer who influenced me and now I'm learning more about his story, right? But those are the things that I wish we had explored more as students. And I wish I had done more as a teacher uh, but now at a museum, I find that I'm connecting more dots. I am more excited to listen to, to really unpack more sides to one story. And I want students to not accept linear timelines, but to really be, um, to be kind of explorers with me, to challenge me to develop more spider webs of knowledge and to not challenge me for the heck of challenging me, but to bring their own voices backed by research, inquiry, and concept where they can truly add to the body of knowledge in a meaningful intellectual way and grow it together. Fantastic. Um, 
on that same topic, I think um, this questioner is asking, um, did the last few years make you look at the approach at the Cooper Hewitt collection of design objects to solve or improve aspects um, in our lives any differently as a person or a staff member? So like, I think they're really asking about the, the sort of really compressed timeline around the pandemic and everything else and how it might have shifted your approach there. I had all kinds of epiphanies during the pandemic. So, so this may be a completely different talk <laughs> um, because I also found that, you know, you're, you're, we are at the Smithsonian. It's this, this place that has these amazing collections. But during the pandemic, we realized that there were people struggling, right? So the priority of object versus people you really started to think about that a little bit more. But where I found the collection really helpful was in helping people see that some of the lessons that we were struggling to learn, we as people had learned them before. So when people were terrified about COVID, it helped to go back and look at stories on the Spanish flu it helps to go back and look at how masks are cultural objects that have been a part of the world over time for various reasons. You know, there are things that are celebrated, but there are things that are protective, that these are not things that we need to fear all the time, that, that it doesn't have to be a feared object. It can also be an object that you can respect, admire, and especially with kids, you know, where they were really getting worried about wearing a mask, the number of, of kids who've come into the world seeing their parents behind a mask the whole time to give it a positive association. That's really where I started to see the value in having that kind of history behind and seeing how joining some unique dots in the collection was helpful. And how to use a museum's collection in new and unique ways in order to teach, in order to tell better stories, to recontextualize. Um, and that's where I think I go back to the word interpretation because you don't have to always tell the same story in the same way. And where I find the joy of an exhibition is you can take a single object and constantly change the objects around it and the story changes every single time. You know, you can put a bicycle and you could talk a story, tell a story about functionality and then change the story. And it, you're suddenly talking about accessibility and then you're talking about mobility and then you're talking about, you know, um, materiality. And each time you can tell a different story. And that's what's really amazing about story and, history books and how we rewrite history has to have that multi-dimensional exciting approach. And I think that's what I'm taking back with me is new excitement to talk about story or disciplines as multi-tiered, multi-dimensional, multi-modal, but organisms, not definite things, they're flexible. So we should be open to teaching them in new and different ways and allowing for more discourse. I find that um, when people just walk in and out of a gallery, it is so boring because you're just like, I don't know what they thought. I don't know what they reacted. But when they have a conversation with you, there's so much joy. And I find that that's the same in a classroom. When you lecture for an hour and no one reacts to you, it sucks the life energy out of you. I mean, if you're a teacher, you know that. But when they ask, students ask questions or you have a conversation, it makes your day. And so how do we get to where history writing is more of a conversation and we're more open to rewriting, retelling? Um, and, you know, I, I'm going on here, but, you know, that's, that's sort of where I was getting to is, that, that this is more flexible, that, that, it's, it's that it's that hummingbird nest, let's build for flexibility. Yeah, that makes so much sense. I make, what you're saying makes me think about um, Hayden White, who was writing about how we write history. And he said that any given piece of evidence can be implotted and 
an infinite number of ways that the stories will shift based on the context, whether it's a letter somebody wrote in the archive or it's a bicycle in the archive. It means something different depending on how we tell its story. Okay, what about this? Um, this questioner is asking, what are some of the biggest challenges and opportunities that you see for larger cultural institutions? And I think that can mean museums or institutions of higher ed uh, moving forward. I would say to not be encumbered by their histories, by their own histories. And I think that that is the, the single challenge. I think when you look at your past and the weight of it bogs you down, that is the single largest challenge. I see that at the Cooper Hewitt. I find that there are, um, you know, for people who haven't been there, and I, I talked about it in a few classes today, you know, it's it's located in a historic home. It's located in Andrew Carnegie's modest home. Uh, but, you know, it's intimidating for people who don't know anything about design to walk into that home without knowing anything about design, it throws you off. And then to walk in and see everyday objects, the messages are jarring, they're confusing for people. And so, you know, I think I think about some of that. And so if we get bogged down by history, tradition, what a museum should look like, if we get bogged down to it should always be a white box and things should always be in glass cabinets and we should always talk to people through labels and they should never talk back to us or that history classes should always be in a lecture format and that you could never have a discussion um, or that history can never be rewritten, then I think that idea that walls cannot be moved will be the biggest challenge. Um, this is why I think I have huge respect for the architect Frank Lloyd Wright. I got to visit Taliesin up in Wisconsin recently, and that's such a wonderful example I think you have to do the little dance, Jennifer, for your uh, for your lights to come back. <laughs> I did. I came back. <laughs> um, but I went to the Taliesin in Wisconsin, and that's a prime example of how he didn't build his structures to be precious. He built with the idea of change. When more children came along, he added parts to his home, built up walls, took down walls. He uh, built this bird walk thing when he wanted his wife to like go out and talk to the birds, you know, and they were just this idea of building in change and building in flexibility and realizing that every structure can change. I think that that is truly the opportunity. And sometimes the older the structure, whether it's higher ed or in museums, the, the walls feel so immovable <laughs> that I think they can feel like a challenge. Um, but it comes down to, as my presentation title suggests, it's not about the walls, it's about the people and their capacity for change. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, every structure can change. I think that is a perfect place to bring this conversation to its conclusion tonight. I wanna to thank Ruki for being here with us. I wanna thank everyone else who's in this space as well. Um, what I've just dropped in the chat here is a link to a brief survey that we would be really grateful if you would fill it out and let us know what you thought of this event and also a little bit more about who you are. We want you to talk back to us, um, just as Ricky was talking about within the museum, so that we can learn more about who's tuning in with us and why. And also we wanna let you know that we have a series of speakers coming up this semester. So that's the next link I've just dropped in here. Um, coming up, Latoya Ruby Frazier is coming virtually, Chantel Martin, and also then Dean Mitchell will be here in person. So the conversation is just um, sort of in process around all the topics that Ruki has, has offered to us tonight. Thank you, Ruki, for a really fantastic conversation. Best of luck to you at the Kansas City Art Institute. Welcome to the ACAD family. And um, thank you to everybody who joined us tonight. Um, I hope you have a really wonderful evening. Jen, you've been an amazing moderator, wonderful host. 
Thank you all for everyone who attended today. This has been an amazing, just good for the soul conversation. Uh, thanks for all the comments in the chat. I see Sue Seidler, thank you for joining from Kansas City. G great to see you here. And for the rest of you, please reach out through social media. I'd love to see you. And if you wanna see more hummingbird videos, I have them on Instagram. <laughs> uh, but I'd love to stay in touch with most of you. I could talk all day, but Jen, you've been a wonderful host. I'm so very grateful, thank you. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Have a good evening. Bye.